those of you familiar with the first uh, part of the, the drama Faust by Goethe may remember as he was Poodle and Mouse playing with Faust in the beginning, his ironic introduction of himself as um, Ich bin der Geist der States um, which I would translate loosely as I'm the spirit who is the naysayer. I don't believe you. Um, and I think that I say this because having been through several decades of what has happened for us and with us in modern medicine, I've seen quotes, hypotheses about disease mechanisms crumble uh, when we struggle. And I think, as Dr. Schoenfeld said, there's something missing here. Um, we can schlep around with comparisons between diseases that we don't know the mechanism or etiology of. But my guess is that um, there's something big we're missing. And my guess is we're missing an entire model of disease process. Um, another point, <coughs> one of my great teachers, Miller Fisher, <laughs> one of our junior residents, unwary residents, um, proposed in a conference to show him a usual case of Wernicke's aphasia. And Fisher said, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a usual case of anything. And um, he meant a lot about that, as with, that as, he, as with everything he said. Part of it is that every case that comes through our door brings with it, or with him or her, really a dramatic narrative. But the other thing is that every case that comes in is an extraordinary array of biology. And our role is to look closely. And we're not so good at solving biological problems, you know, practical clinicians. But we play a role in placing constraints on the wonderful ideas that our colleagues in the laboratory come up with because a lot of the things we see just aren't that easy. Um, and Degos disease is certainly one of those. Well, a case that has been part of our discussion this afternoon um, was a boy who came in to our senior nurse surgeon in pediatrics, Bill Butler, um, with headaches. The kid had been very healthy up until several months before. And he was found to have papilledema. Now, papilledema doesn't come all that easy. Um, and then Bill did subdural, did just a, a Berholtz. And that's probably not the most certain way of getting rid of subdurals, but it works a lot of the time. But let's take a look at these subdurals. Now, Ellen Grant went through this with you. Now, let's go back and look at this. Butler and I looked at this together, and we knew this wasn't anything we'd ever seen before. And subdural hygroma, if you look at it, is universal. There is a universal envelope of subdural fluid around this brain. There is no part of the subdural compartment that is not filled with a fairly uniform thickness of fluid. And it isn't really deforming the brain very much. Would this have caused papilledema? Who knows? But beats me how one can ascribe this to a focal disease of blood vessels. No way. Protein was high. How about that? A gram point three. Focal disease of blood vessels? We've seen arteritis, cerebral arteritis. Uh, we've seen monoclonal, I mean, uh, phospholipid antibody disorders. Nothing like that. No way. A cerebral hygroma 
Um, this is not, this is only a virtual space. And in fact, the dura and the arachnoid sticks together. <laughs> Under normal circumstances, there are adhesions there. And that's why a collection looks like a lens. But this doesn't look like a lens. This looks like a subdural compartment where there simply is no affinity between these two apose layers. Have we got a mechanism for that? I'd say we strike out completely. This is a, this is a, a phenomenon for which we have no model. And um, just to lay it on a bit, um, for kids who have subdural hygromas, you know, there's always some obvious reason for it. They've been shaken, they post-surgical infections a lot, and particularly for the little ones are infected. This kid hadn't had any of that. This was not an abused child. This kid had not been uh, skateboarding without a helmet. He had a, quote, idiopathic. Yeah, that's, that's useful for us. Okay, and then this kid had a bilaterally. Not only bilaterally, he had a universally. <laughs> Butler had never seen that. I'd never seen it. Liz Dooling, our most experienced child neurologist, she'd never seen that. Well, <laughs> the burr holes didn't work. And so Bill brought um, the boy back in, and this time uh, put in the subdural shunts. And at that point, he <laughs> said, you know, we might as well have some neurologists around too. And so um, he invited us to see the boy with him. And he had taken a dural biopsy. Now, preliminarily, the preliminary reading on this biopsy was zip, normal. And it's probably not a bad idea for a clinician to go over and see his own biopsies. And um, to Matt Frosch's credit, uh, one of the reasons that we go see him is that he'd look through every slide. And on one section, on one slide, he had found this. And he said, um, beats me what it means, and it could be nonspecific, but I want to show it to you. Well, for me, this was a flashback to... Um, rapidly fading memories of my internship in 1963 when I had seen this in our first case of Degos syndrome. A case that presented fairly like common alicat, came in with belly pain, thought to be lymphoma, um, died of bowel infarction, 20-some-year-old boy. But at any rate, a, benign, a bland endothelial Vas proliferative vasculopathy. And um, so that we discussed that after that, that morning, uh, the possibility of this being the Degos disease, principally to say, yes, isn't it interesting? This is a shared histopathologic picture, but so much for that, because this boy does not have the defining clinical features of um, Degos disease. Well, you know, things uh, went from bad to worse and the abdominal pain intervened, progressed, horrendous course, relentless. Um, and no, we had no good ideas. Um, but then, I don't remember how it happened, Matt, but as I recall, they changed pediatricians, and you were the pathologist, and so called and said, you know, this kid's got a funny skin rash. And so you emailed me, and um, we, I came in and um, found the boy had been admitted with just massive ascites. And so Liz and I were in the intensive care unit, and the boy was getting a, a peritonocentesis, and all you could see were his thighs. And there were three skin lesions on there. They were the skin lesion of Dago's disease. It was diagnostic. I suppose skin biopsies and all that stuff helped, but that was so distinctive that the diagnosis was made right then. And Alan um, Zikowitz, our chief of pediatrics, said, you know, these are, this is important diagnosis you guys have made. My only comment would be is I wish it could have been anything else. Um, that bright light sort of blinded me and probably the rest of you to these wonderful pictures by um, 
from uh, Bonnie McCool. But there they are. And it just makes the point that, you know, if you're a clinician, there's something distinctive shows up in the hospital, you go see it. Because those of you who've seen that um, 35 years later, um, you'll still remember it. Um, this, is, this is the way the skin looked in this boy. And um, uh, there were only two or three that we saw at that point, but there were a lot more once the covers came off. But this picture here, I'd like to revisit this issue as well, too. These are photographs that Dan Duty, the general surgeon, uh, made when he was, did the explorer pleural laparotomy and closed the boy back up. Yes, we see infarctions, don't we? These infarctions have a systematic orientation. They have almost a modular distribution, an equal distribution. Now, being a neuroscientist, I'd say it looks like cortical columns, but I'm, I know that's not right because it's not the brain. Yeah. <laughs> with surrounding tissue, that's normal. I mean, if you see somebody, you know, who has just kind of cracked their process, it just moves along. There's a thing that here, but this comes out uh, hopefully. It's modular. What is the, I, and, and again, is it neural? Is it blood vessels? Is it some pattern? Is it a compressor uh -huh. function? Well, you know, I would say that this is consistent with a, probably with a vascular pattern of some sort. But why should it hit, why should it hit these vessels in that modular pattern? You know, I think that, that, you know, we kid ourselves if we think that we have any model in our head to accommodate this phenomenon. And then <laughs> we did everything we knew how to do. I mean, this is, this set of negative studies is just a, a testimony to desperation. And virtually, um, at this point, we realized that we had no idea about the pathophysiology. And we're throwing out as broad a net as we could. And um, it wasn't as if uh, this wasn't a, a tremendously agonizing struggle for all. And uh, out of this, also, um, Eric Grabowski and his group did VEGF levels. And these were sky high. And then he had also a profile consist consistent with DIC. But the VEGS levels, I mean, did it suggest, to come back to hypotheses that have been thrown out this afternoon, that do we have a problem with vascular proliferation? Well, there again, um, does an elevated VEGF level give a bland endothelial proliferation that is progressive in these sized vessels? Who knows? No clue. And um, so again, as a just, we did what Dr. Sosha was talking about. We threw everything in but the kitchen sink that might affect coagulation. But really, if you think of what that subdural collection looked like, there's no reason to think that this is a vascular occlusive disease entirely. No way that that could do that, or papilledema. On the other hand, obviously the boy is having vascular occlusions. But vascular occlusions are probably somewhere downstream, a manifestation of a disease which is much more broadly cast and mysterious than that. But, um, you know, we gave VEGF, we gave uh, dipyramidol, we gave fundoparanox, a 10A um, blocker. But then uh, we were rewarded with a catastrophe. Um, the boy uh, hemorrhaged massively into his cerebellum and, and died. Um, so I think that, I, I mean, it's not that, <laughs> be sort of thoroughly my career as a guy that states for night, but I'm, my feeling is that, you know, we've, through these years, we've seen models based upon our concepts at a time give way to models often that are much simpler and convincing. Look at lysencephaly. It all fitted together with the cloning of the LIS1 gene. Look at the Walker-Warburg syndrome. Man, you ought to read that literature. Great ideas about that fitted together with the identification of the dystroglycan mutation. Look at um, prion disease that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh.
presentation is the recent description of necrogenic fibrosing dermopathy. Uh -huh. Sean Cowper, who's the expert on it, the paper that he wrote was as complex as kind of a system of Ptolemy. He had like nine categories, subcategories, and this and that. Uh -huh. And then finally, it was just a gadolinium. And then it all made sense. Yeah. You know, so until you had the answer, you have, it's so confusing. I mean, yeah. you know, and it, it just, it's, it's, it's all out there. And I agree that in the end, there probably is going to be some simple explanation. Yeah. And there could be cascades of levels of understanding, which ultimately, you know, in the biology that surrounds us here, it can be very beautiful. Um, you know, prisoners breakthrough on prion, as you said, that was a big thing, but we still didn't understand it. You know, you said, you know, how can it be a self-propagating pro 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 protein co configuration? You know, things don't do that. Um, but now an entirely new way of looking at prion disease is coming up. That these are highly adaptive efficient sort of large-scale mechanisms of conformational change from one stable state to another that certainly allows yeast to do things quick and probably the proteins in our body to do things quickly too. So, you know, I think that it's probably not a bad idea biologically, but it's one that's gone a cropper. And um, I think that, that at the moment, uh, well enough for us to describe vascular lesions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it seems to me that um, this is a disorder which is still looking for a good idea. Okay.